Well, <clears throat> hello again. Here I am, one year almost to the day after I sat here and told you about a trip that I'd recently done on a CRF 450L. Hello, well. Ooh. Down to Morocco and then back up to the UK again. And this year, I've chosen to do pretty much the same trip again, only this time on the Yamaha, the T700, the new Tenere. And I thought I'd take the opportunity, seeing as it was uh, quite well received last year, to just give you my impressions of the bike after, I guess, a relatively long trip, but certainly a trip that made me feel I'd done enough miles on the bike to be able to share some of my experiences with you. So, what was that trip? Well, those of you who watched the CRF 450L review last year will know because it's pretty much the same thing. We, we, me and the bike, left the UK uh, the week before Christmas and travelled down to Portsmouth and then from Portsmouth on a ferry down to Bilbao. Bilbao, a thousand kilometres down on tarmac across Spain down here to the Rider Centre. Along the coast to Motril, which is a new port I've never traveled from before, and over to Nador in the northeast corner of Morocco. Uh, from Nador, pretty much in a straight line, right the way down, the best part of over a thousand kilometers, down past the sand dunes in Mazuga, down towards Agora, down into Fumsgid, to the dunes down there, before turning round and coming back again on piste, right the way back up. Um, through the mountains, through Midelt, for those of you who know the area, and then through Meknes. Again on some trails and checking out some new pieces, and back up to here at the Rider Centre, and my final leg is another thousand kilometres uh, up north now, back to the ferry and home. A total round trip of about five and a half thousand kilometres. At this point, I'm about four thousand kilometres into my trip. And to give you an idea of the breakdown of how that looks in terms of the terrain that I've ridden, we're on about um, two and a half thousand so far on tarmac roads, motorways, A roads, um, smaller roads too, but, but solid. Probably around um, 1,500, maybe a little bit more on unsurfaced roads. And to break that down, 50% of that on twin track, 40% of that this year on single track and about 10% of that on no tracks at all. So that's just me wandering around in the desert or in sand dunes. So you've got an idea of the bike that I went on, the distance and the terrain that I've ridden. Where to start on the T7? I think before I talk about the specific bike, I'm going to jump back a year. And I'm going to reintroduce a little bit what happened last year to give you some context to something that I feel is really, really important in the world of adventure motorcycling at this time. So this time last year, I sat here and I told you about how excited I was and how amazed I was at the new Honda CRF 450L. Would this be a good bike for leaving in your garage and rolling out 50, 60, 70, 80 miles, 100, 120 kilometers to a local trail, blasting out some trails and then riding home again. Yes, yes, absolutely it would. It's a trail bike in the true traditional sense of the word trail bike. Um, and to summarize the reason for my surprise and my sort of joy at that bike, um, it was about this idea that motorcycle manufacturers perhaps we're starting to understand what adventure motorcyclists wanted from motorcycles. And I think that can be summed up by saying that we don't necessarily want a particular motorcycle that has any specifically brilliant characteristics. I'm not looking for um, a 300 two-stroke bike that can climb up the steepest hills brilliantly easily nor am I looking at something which will munch a thousand miles of tarmac in a day and leave me feeling fresh. The problem with adventure motorcycling is, by definition, adventure is not knowing what's going to come next. And so, as an adventure motorcyclist, I, and I think we as a community, want a bike that doesn't necessarily do one thing brilliantly, but will do lots of things really competently. And 
There have always been some bikes that would do that, but they seem to be older bikes, or they always seem to be bikes that we had to buy and bolt things on and strip things off and modify. And so the reason I was so excited last year about the CRF 450L was that for the first time in a long time, a manufacturer had developed a new bike, essentially it was an off-road motorcycle, but they chopped away 10% of the off-road capability of the bike and they'd bolted onto the other side of it this enormous capacity, this capability for doing large road miles in relative comfort and, and quiet. And what I did was it opened up the envelope of that motorcycle, making it really, really suitable for lightweight adventure motorcycling. And to me, that was a very, very exciting thing. Now, what's that got to do with the Yamaha T7 behind me? Well, unbelievably and wonderfully, Yamaha have kind of gone and done the same thing except they started at the other end. Um, they've started in the middleweight adventure class and they've taken a bike which weighs 200 kilograms wet and which is normally or traditionally would be used for riding on very simple tracks and trails or on roads and they've extended its off-road capability and turned it into something which is um, quite impressive. So we now have a number of motorcycles and potentially more. I'm only talking about the two that I've ridden on fairly long trips in the last 12 months. You know, we could also be talking about the new KTM, the new 792, um, but I haven't got that far just yet. Um, exciting times for adventure motorcyclists, definitely. So let's jump in a bit more to the T7 itself. And let me start by having told you where I've been, tell you what I did to the bike before I left, give you some context. Okay, so we'll start at the bottom of the bike and I'll work upwards as I go. Um, the classic comment that the cheapest and best thing you can do to your bike to modify it, um, to improve its performance, is to change the tires, is, is true for the Tenere. Um, the tires it comes with are great if you're gonna be predominantly riding on road or very easy, shallow, hard packed trails, but really they're not suitable for quite difficult and challenging off-road uh, sections or soft sand. And so I swapped them out immediately for a set of Motos uh, Tractionator RAL Z's, or RAL Z's. And these are a fantastic, aggressive off-road tire. A 150 section on the rear, 9090 on the front, specifically designed for that big fat four inch rim. Um, a tubeless tire in theory, but can also be run tubed, as is the case on the Tenere, because the Tenere has a 21 and 18 inch spoked wheel, as any true off-road motorcycle tends to do. And so I added some extra uber heavy duty tubes to the bike. And I also added some slime in there um, to try and help me to stop any of those thorn or those, those pinch punctures that you can get quite frustratingly. So new, new tires, new tubes, and some slime. Foot pegs, slightly larger. Um, the bike is beautifully slim around the center section behind the tank, but um, it does, feel to me, particularly if you wear knee braces with the bike, that the pegs are slightly narrow. And so um, Chris, my business partner, persuaded me to put some, some fatter pegs on. And um, I'll talk about that a little bit later, but they definitely benefit the bike. It's quite a heavy bike. And just pulling those feet out, just a little bit more leverage, gives you a bit more muscle on the bike. So that, that proved to be really successful. Okay, um, let's move upwards from there. Um, a bash plate forwards. Uh, bash plate on the bike, critical. Two frame rails coming around underneath, a very vulnerable sump and the normal um, oil filter right on the front of the engine. So we're looking to put something in there to stop not only the bike bottoming out, because it's a fairly heavy bike, the suspension is quite soft, more on that later. And um, also we want to try and protect that oil filter and those engine casings from flying rocks. Um, so a bash plate, Always makes good sense on any adventure motorcycle, we all know that. Crash bars, um, not something that I'm a huge fan of bolting onto motorcycles. Um, I'm not really a fan of bolting anything onto motorcycles that adds weight. Um, we sold thousands of crash bars for the BMW F800 GS, and I would hope that the majority of them saw action um, falling over in a car park or on a simple gravel trail. Unfortunately, some of them I know saw some fairly serious accidents, and they did save both a bike and riders. So they do have a, a serious purpose, but in the case of the Tenere, perhaps more relevant than ever, because you will ride this motorcycle 
off-road, almost certainly, and more of that later, um, you have to expect to drop this bike. And I don't mean once or twice in its lifetime, I mean regularly as you ride it. And those crash bars are not just there for the cosmetic job of making it look cool or even saving the plastics. They're also there to stop the vulnerable radiators getting crushed or smashed in the event of drops. So a really important job, on they went. Um, hand guards, obviously, aluminium backbones. Let's get those levers and those fingers protected for those drops. It's a big, heavy bike when it goes down. Um, we've put some double tape mirrors on there so they can be folded in for off-road sections. And if they do get bumped or banged, um, they're not gonna get damaged. We can just fold them back out again, which is really good. Electrical points, uh, one socket provided on the bike, but only with a two amp fuse. Possibly okay, a little worrying, so I put a second electrical line in with a 10 amp fuse onto a, a double charging USB socket, which I've been running and charging a lot of my camera equipment and phone off whilst I've been out and about. And then moving toward the back of the bike, you can see a set of luggage on there. Um, I've added a set of our own luggage racks to the back of the bike, which are not tubular, they're flat bent plate, and they just keep that luggage from folding under into the back wheels uh, particularly if you're using a pannier setup as I have. I'm using our Adventure Spec Magadan pannier, as you can see there. And if you want to see more about those and some of the setup of the bike, I'm going to do a separate video on the various bits that we bolt to the bike um, that you can have a look at. It'll be in the link in the description below if you want to go into more detail. But that also includes a flat plate back rack on the bike in case you want to add extra fuel capacity. You can bolt a um, you can bolt a rotor pack mount onto that. The exhaust, which isn't standard. It's not something I would normally change because I like a quiet bike. But in this case, we've developed the NCAN ourselves. And even though we've managed to keep the noise levels to a very, very similar level to the standard can, we have saved a significant proportion of weight. And when you've got a bike of this weight, any little bit you can, you can help to remove is a good thing. And finally, the one change from standard in terms of bike performance, I've got some progressive fork springs in the front of the bike. And... That's because, in my opinion, the front end of the bike felt very, very stiff um, from the dealer. No matter what I did, I felt those, those springs were just a little, bit, a little bit too stiff, so I swapped those out. And in fact, also, I think the rear spring is probably a little too soft, which I rode because I'm only 75 kilos. But again, if you're much bigger than me, you might want to think about swapping out that back spring. But we can talk about that again if you're interested in a separate video. Well, now, before I set off on this trip, um, everybody in the office could see my face as I uh, moaned and groaned about lumping this great big motorcycle around this workshop because those of you who haven't seen last year's review or perhaps don't know me, and I imagine that's most of you, um, will know that most of my riding is on small, lightweight dirt bikes. And trying to move this thing even around the local workshop was a, was a handful. This is a 200 kilo motorbike without anything extra bolted onto it. It's big and it's heavy. And to be honest, I wasn't really that enthusiastic about the idea of coming down here and riding this bike so many miles to such a remote environment. So I kind of had a bit of a downer on the bike, despite the amazing reviews and all of the people shouting about it on social media and all of the journalists' reviews. I'm always a little bit skeptical. And so I was more than just a little bit surprised to find that this bike is something quite exceptional. Um, its road performance is not really gonna be discussed here because I don't think any of us would question that. 80, 90 miles an hour on the motorway um, in pretty atrocious UK December conditions, howling side winds, head winds, uh, pouring down rain, water, lashing around. Um, so you can imagine surface water standing, some snow coming back down through Spain. In all of those conditions, the bike performed on the road beautifully. It was collected, calm, fantastic power delivery, um, no problems uh, in, the, in, in, in any kind of bends or um, anything that you might think it might want to get a little bit twitchy in those situations with a, with a fairly solid off-road tire on it. It behaved impeccably. I would say it weaves about 95 um, miles per hour, but I mean, that's not really to be um, surprised at under the circumstances. And I don't really think you can fault the bike for that. Road-wise, I've been astonished by it. Fantastic. 
let's um, let's think about the and talk about the off-road performance of the bike, which is really where you would expect the performance to be a little bit limited. Okay, so why would you expect the performance to be limited? Well, it's a middleweight adventure bike. And traditionally, we would put a BMW F800 GS next to a Triumph Tiger XC800. And if we were to sit this T7 in a row next to those two bikes, I don't think anyone would bat an eyelid. Um, it would sit there beautifully. It would look like those other two bikes. Um, and that would be a misleading image because this is not the same as a BMW F100 GS or a Triumph Tiger XC800 or almost any other middleweight bike that I've ever had the often misfortune to throw my leg over and try and ride off-road. Um, whoever has designed this bike was given a design brief to inspire and to really engage the adventure motorcycling community and to make a motorcycle of 200 plus kilos ride off-road. And I don't just mean ride off-road in terms of it can, because you can ride anything off-road. This thing rides off-road with style. Uh, you know, it's a joyful, fun, playful experience riding this bike off-road. Its power delivery is beautifully linear and controllable. Um, its clutch is light. Um, the balance of the bike is astonishingly good on brakes, on power. Um, when it starts to slide uphill, downhill, it carries its weight unbelievably well. Unbelievably well. The balance of the bike, um, yeah, I mean, it's... It rides with such ease. It gives you such an astonishing level of confidence in its abilities that it's it's almost difficult to try and explain unless you've experienced it. And I very quickly, when I got down to Morocco and started hitting the twin track, the bouldery riverbeds, the, um, the sandy ruts, I very quickly started to understand why so many people on social media are having this massive rant about how wonderful this bike is. It is an astonishing achievement, astonishing, you know, so in terms of its off-road riding ability, I would go as far as to say this bike is probably more capable than 90% of the riders who will ever ride it. It is, in the hands of somebody really good, capable of something unbelievably special, almost certainly. Well, you know, I could do the traditional motorcycle journalist thing and start whinging and moaning about some bits and pieces. Um, the fuel economy is not great, uh, 45 miles a gallon down from the UK to the southern Spain on the motorways uh, and an average through the following mm, 2,000 kilometres of on and off road of only 17 kilometres a litre, 50 miles a gallon. That's UK gallons. Um, not particularly frugal. I could complain about the fact that I don't like the lights very much. I don't like the dipped beam. It has a wide slot and I don't think they're particularly effective at night. And I could complain about things like the fuel gauge, which is particularly bizarre, um, which tells you nothing about the first third of the operation of the bike, gives you an indication of every 12 miles or 20 kilometers of use after that, down to the last third of the tank when it just says, oh, you've hardly got any left, and leaves you hanging again. Um, but it kind of feels like that's nitpicky because it wasn't so long ago that People like Walter Kolbach, you know, we're, we're having to strip down uh, BMW X Challenge bikes to make a bike similar to this. And when I say strip down, replacing triple clamps, front forks, you know, doing massively major modifications to bikes to get them to the point where they felt anywhere near as competent as this. And in reality, this bike rides astonishingly well off the shelf. So from an adventure riding point of view, the few things that I'm picking holes in kind of seem pretty irrelevant really um, there are very few bad things about this bike yeah i mean yes it is could you get a better road bike yes you could of course but in the true style of an adventure motorcycle if you were to jump on this and ride around the world tomorrow and never leave tarmac I don't think you would be found wanting in terms of its ability to deliver power, its braking, its cornering. It is 
a fantastic bike to enjoy on tarmac, um, no question. Well, funnily enough, I think it thinks that it is. I think it thinks it's a giant off-road motorcycle. Um, and that sounds a bit of a strange thing to say, but um, it almost has delusions of grandeur. Um, it, 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 it loves its off-road section so much, and it gives you so much joy, you can almost feel this bike come alive when it hits the off-road sections. So. Well, um, no, nothing's perfect. Um, it's a 200 kilo motorcycle. Before you start adding luggage and, and adding the extra bits and pieces on that any sensible adventure motorcycle rider will add. It has a heavy front feel to it. Of course it does. It's a heavy bike. Um, when it does let go, when it finally reaches its limitations, or you reach your own limitations in terms of the way that you ride it, when it drops, it drops quickly and quite surprisingly. Although that, that could just be me, because I'm not used to riding big bikes and maybe I'd adjust to that, but I don't find the, the failure of it when it does go down very progressive. Um, and whilst I was left with an overwhelming sense of that this thing is astonishingly good and amazing, I can't help noticing that I dropped this bike eight times more than I dropped the CRF 450L on an almost identical trip last year. Now, if it was a couple of drops extra, you might just say, well, that's the way it rolls. But as I said before, this bike almost feels like it promises more than it delivers. Um, although, again, it could be my riding ability. It definitely isn't perfect. But, you know, it can't be perfect because the laws of physics apply to this bike and a 200 kilo bike is never going to be as capable off-road as a 120 kilo bike. That's just simply the way it is. But for its weight, it's impressive. And is it perfect? For a middleweight adventure bike, it is far more perfect than anything else that I have ever ridden to this point. It's probably the perfect bike for riding remote, long distance trips with terrain that is mostly within your ability. And I say that because occasionally you may well meet a hard piece of track or trail that you need to, to, to push on with and, and attack quite aggressively. And this bike will help you to do that. But, um, Ultimately, as I said before, when it goes down, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes, um, you are going to experience some issues. Um, conversely, maybe you might want to ride your local trails and tracks, some harder stuff. You might want to get out there and get stuck in with this bike. And if you do that, you're going to have a great time on it. But you might want to do that with a group of your friends, a group of people who can help you to lift, to modify, to move, to tug around, to realign, to have another go, to guide you. Um, and that's very much in line with the kind of stuff I'm seeing people do on this bike uh, on social media. All the technical hard stuff seems to be localized, tight stuff. There doesn't seem to be anyone really pushing their limits on this bike uh, in the middle of nowhere. And there's a reason for that. Uh, and it might be quite a controversial thing to say, maybe not, but I'm going to say it anyway. I don't believe that this motorcycle is self-regulating. Now, it sounds like a weird thing to say, so let me explain. It almost has delusions of grandeur, it's that good. So what do I mean by that? If you get, or you got, on an F800 GS, and you jumped on it and you blasted up um, your favorite local track or trail, personally, within about 200 meters, <sighs> I got a sense that that's really not what that bike should be for. It was kind of bloody hell. Whew, slow it down, slowly turn it around, ride it off the end of that trail, and accept that pretty much this is a big heavy bike and it's gonna be most at home on unsurfaced roads that were quite simplistic. And um, if you kept it within its design envelope, you're gonna have a good time with it. This bike, 
it almost has no sense of, of where it should be. Um, if, you, if you drop onto your local trail on this bike and you give it some beans, this bike comes with a little devil. And as soon as you start that engine, it sits on your shoulder. And as soon as you hit that off-road track or trail, it starts whispering to you. Hey, give it a bit more. We can do this. Hit it in third. Come on, you know, let's go faster. It almost eggs you on. Such is the joy that it seems to have for the off-road sections. Until soon you find yourself riding harder and faster and further than you would ever normally do on a bike of this size, which is just amazing until it isn't amazing. And at that point, what happens is this incredibly designed piece of motorcycle, like any motorcycle, ends up on its side on the floor. And then your problems start. And there it is. There it is. The first drop in sand. I'm in a low-lying dune field, nothing serious at all. Just a typical sort of thing you ride on any bike. And uh, as usual with these things, every now and again, you get one soft dune and you hit it the same as you hit all the other dunes. Front end piles in and you drop it. And uh, this is the effect of trying to pick the bike up. Because at a minimum of 200 kilos, by the time I've got the various bits and pieces bolted onto this, plus luggage, plus fuel, plus my additions and bits and pieces, I'm probably looking at 230 kilograms of motorcycle. And I can tell you that the, I think three days ago, I dropped the bike about well, exactly eight times in a day in sand dunes, in sandy ruts, um, one particular rocky climb. And wow, you know, 230 kilograms takes some serious amount of lifting and grafting and groaning to go upright again. And to be honest, by the end of that day, I was knackered, really, really tired. Struggling to pull it round, to lift it. it. It's almost, you can get yourself into a position with this bike very quickly that probably you entirely possibly won't be able to get yourself out of unless you have the support of other riders. And personally, when I go riding, I like to know that I can look after myself and extract myself. Because even if there's only two of you riding together, the truth is if your friend has an accident or can't ride out or the bike breaks down or whatever happens, I need to be able to get out of there by myself. I, like to be, I, I really need to be self-reliant. That's kind of what my trips are about. And self-reliance on a bike of this size is great until it goes down and then it becomes a big, big challenge. So <laughs> a massive grin-inducing smile fest, better than any of the middleweight bike I've had the pleasure of riding to date, but still something which fills me with a little bit of fear, um, particularly when you're riding remotely or by yourself or in ones and twos. I'm amazed by it. I am amazed by it. I never would have believed you could get a bike of this weight to ride so beautifully. I've been told by people like Lyndon Poskett and Simon Pavey, uh, who, who used to ride the old big BMWs in the Dakar when they had the big 50 litre slab slided fuel tanks. And the ASO would send these guys out. Simon tells of days where they send them to the Mauritanian dunes to do a thousand kilometers. And I always wondered how that was possible. I almost viewed these people like superhumans. But, you know, maybe if you built a bike to that tolerance and that standard, as those guys did for those rallies and those events, maybe that sort of riding is possible. And with this bike, I can see that if you were good enough, that would be possible. But <clears throat> I'm not sure it's possible for me. Well, if I was doing the same trip I did this year, yeah, yeah, I would. Because the bike was more than capable of doing everything that I did. I would probably change some thoughts about the routes and the things that I did. But overall, it's an extremely capable bike for going down to Morocco and riding recognized tracks and trails if you know your way around or if you're sticking to the main pistes. Perhaps 
The better question might be though, when I go back to Morocco next year, will I take that bike with me? And the truthful answer to that is no, 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 I won't. For me, I can get across the plains of Spain just as quickly and easily on a CRF 450L. Um, I'm a little bit more uncomfortable, but when I get to Morocco, the CRF 450L doesn't dictate to me where I can ride and how I can ride. I don't have to avoid sand dunes or I don't have to choose to ride around a hill if I want to ride over it. The truth is, weight is king. And a bike that's 80 kilograms lighter than this one will always be a better, more competent ride in an off-road challenging situation if it's properly made and set up right. So, no. For this particular trip, as much as I think that is an astonishing motorcycle, I didn't really bond with it. It wasn't for me for this particular trip. Now this bike is, is ours, it belongs to Adventure Spec. We bought it. Um, and so we're gonna have it through 2020 and what are we gonna do with it? Well, I'm gonna use it for exactly the things that I talked about a few minutes ago. Um, we're gonna take this bike, we're gonna run it in the Adventure Spec Challenge in the Keel of Forests and um, down in Wales for the Wales 500 um, on a number of UK rallies. We're probably gonna go out trail riding with it locally with groups of friends where if there are problems and the bike does get dropped, I can be helped to lift and put it back. And we're gonna play with it and we're gonna see what can happen. And maybe over the next year, my opinion of the bike will change as I get more used to the idea of weight. Um, and I get used to more what the bike can do because I don't really feel I've explored its envelope yet because I'm still a little bit scared of it, to be truthful. I think we've got here something that's massively, massively special. We've got a middleweight bike that pushes that envelope of off-road performance really deeply now, down back towards that CRF 450L territory, whilst we've got the CRF 450L pushing that envelope of road performance out towards the middleweight class. We've got two motorcycles here whose design envelopes are so much bigger than anything that's gone before. And it's such an exciting time for us. The 790, I believe, people tell me is even more off-road competent than the T7, although I've yet to try it, you know? And with bikes like the 690 sort of hovering around in between those things, this is a great time to be an adventure motorcyclist. And it's been an absolute pleasure and a privilege to experience um, this bike that those guys at Yamaha designed almost for me. Um, it, it, I get such a buzz from the fact that somebody kind of gets what we as adventure motorcyclists want, that um, I can see already why the press sing about it. I can see why um, social media rant about it. They're gonna sell thousands of these bikes and they should do. So if you got to the end of the video, just like last year, thank you very much for your patience. I hope this review has been of some interest to you. And uh, yeah, massive thumbs up and uh, let's all have a great time riding in 2020. Take care, ride safe.